The Glamour by Thomas Ligotti It had long been my practice to wander late at night, and often to attend movie theaters at this time. But something else was involved on the night I went to that theater in a part of town I had never visited before. A new tendency, a mood or penchant formerly unknown to me, seemed to lead the way. How difficult to say anything precise about this mood that overcame me, because it seemed to belong to my surroundings as much to myself. As I advanced farther into that part of town I had never visited before, my attention was drawn to a certain aspect of things, a fine aura of fantasy radiating from the most common sights, places, and objects that were both blurred and brightened in my gaze. Despite the lateness of the hour, there was an active glow cast through many of the shop windows I passed. Along one particular avenue, the starless evening was glazed by these lights, these diamonds of plate glass set within old buildings of dark brick. I paused before the display window of a toy store, and was entranced by a chaotic tableau of preposterous excitation. My eyes followed several things at once the fated antics of mechanized monkeys that clapped tiny cymbals or somersaulted uncontrollably, the destined pirouettes of a music box ballerina, the grotesque wobbling of a newly sprung jack in the box. The inside of the store was a Christmas tree clutter of merchandise receding into a background that looked shadowed and empty. An old man with a smooth pate and angular eyebrows stepped forward to the front window and began rewinding some of the toys to keep them in ceaseless gyration. While performing this task, he suddenly looked up at me, his face expressionless. I moved down the street, where other windows framed little worlds so strangely picturesque and so dreamily illuminated in the shabby darkness of that part of town. One of them was a bakery whose window display was a gallery of sculptured frosting, a winter landscape of swirling, drifting whiteness, of snowy rosettes and layers of icy glitter. At the center of the glacial kingdom was a pair of miniature people frozen atop a many-tiered wedding cake. But beyond the brilliant arctic scene, I saw only the deep blackness of an establishment that was closed for the night. Standing outside another window nearby, I was uncertain if the place was open for business or not. In the background, a few figures were positioned here and there within faded lighting, reminiscent of an old photograph, though it seemed they were beings of the same kind as the window dummies of this store, which apparently trafficked in dated styles of clothing. Even the faces of the mannequins, as a glossy light fell upon them, wore the placidly enigmatic expressions of a different time. I saw no one enter or exit the many doors along the sidewalks where I strolled that night. A canvas awning that some proprietor had neglected to roll up for the night was flapping in the wind. Nevertheless, as I have described, there reigned a vitality of enterprise everywhere I looked, and I felt the kind of acute anticipation that a child might experience at a carnival, where each lurid attraction incites fantastic speculations, while unexpected desires arise for something which has no specific qualities in the imagination, yet seems to be only a few steps away. Thus my mood had not abandoned me, but only grew stronger, a possessing impulse without object. Then I saw the marquee for a movie theater, though not one I intended to patronize. For the letters spelling out the name of the theater were broken and unreadable, while the title on the marquee was similarly damaged, as if stones had been thrown at it, a series of attempts made to efface the words that I finally deciphered. The feature being advertised was called The Glamour. When I reached the front of the theater, I found that the row of doors forming the entrance had been barricaded by crosswise planks, with notices posted upon them warning that the building had been condemned. This action was apparently taken some time ago, judging by the weathered condition of the boards that blocked my way, and the dated appearance of the notices stuck upon them. As I was about to proceed on my way, however, I saw that the marquee was illuminated, wretchedly aglow with a light that I previously thought was a reflection from a nearby street lamp. It was beneath this same street lamp that I now noticed a double-faced sign propped up on the sidewalk, an inconspicuous little board that read, Entrance to the Theater. Beneath these words was an arrow pointing into an alleyway which separated the theater from the remaining buildings on the block. P. 
peeking into this dark opening, this aperture in the otherwise solid facade of that particular street, I saw only a long narrow corridor with a single light set far into its depths. The light shone with a strange shade of purple, like that of a freshly exposed heart, and appeared to be positioned over a doorway leading into the theater. It had long been my practice to attend late performances at movie theaters. This is what I reminded myself. But whatever reservations I felt at the time were easily overcome by a new surge of the mood I was experiencing that night in a part of town I had never visited before. The purple lamp did indeed mark a way into the theater, casting its arterial light upon a door that reiterated the word entrance. Stepping inside, I entered a tight hallway where the walls glowed a deep pink, very similar in tint to that little beacon in the alley, but more reminiscent of a richly blooded brain than a beating heart. At the end of the hallway I could see my reflection in a ticket window, and approaching it I noticed that those walls so close to me were veiled from floor to ceiling with what appeared to be cobwebs. This gossamer material was also strewn upon the carpet leading to the ticket window, wispy shrouds that did not scatter when I walked over them, as if they had securely bound themselves to the carpet's worn and shallow fiber, or were tightly combed into it, sparse hairs sticking to the scalp of an old corpse. There was no one behind the ticket window, no one I could see in that small space of darkness beyond the blur of purple-tinted glass in which my reflection was held. Nevertheless, a ticket was protruding from a slot beneath the semicircular cutaway at the bottom of the window, sticking out like a paper tongue. A few hairs lay beside it. "'Admission is free,' said a man who was now standing in the doorway beside the ticket booth. His suit was well fitted and neat but his face appeared somehow a mess, bristling all over its contours. His tone was polite, even passive, when he said, The theater is under new ownership. Are you the manager? I asked. I was just on my way to the restroom. Without further comment, he drifted off into the darkness of the theater. For a moment something floated in the empty space he left in the doorway a swarm of filaments like dust that scattered or settled before I stepped through. And in those first few seconds inside, all I could see were the words, Restroom, glowing above a door as it slowly closed. I maneuvered with caution until my sight became sufficient to the dark and allowed me to find a door leading to the auditorium of the movie theater. But once inside, as I stood at the summit of a sloping aisle, all previous orientation to my surroundings underwent a setback. The room was illuminated by an elaborate chandelier centered high above the floor, as well as a series of light fixtures along either of the side walls. I was not surprised by the dimness of the lighting, nor by its hue, which made shadows appear faintly bloodshot, a sickly liverish shade that might be witnessed in an operating room, where a torso lies open on the table, its entrails a palette of pinks and reds and purples, diseased viscera imitating all the shades of sunset. However, my perception of the theater auditorium remained problematic, not because of any oddities of illumination, but for another reason. While I experienced no difficulty in mentally registering the elements around me, the separate aisles and rows of seats, the curtain-flanked movie screen, the well-noted chandelier and wall lights, it seemed impossible to gain a sense of these features in simple accord with their appearances. I saw nothing that I have not described. Yet the round-backed seats were at the same time rows of headstones in a graveyard. The aisles were endless filthy alleys, long desolate corridors in an old asylum, or the dripping passages of a sewer narrowing into the distance. The pale movie screen was a dust-blinded window in a dark, unvisited cellar, a mirror gone roomy with age in an abandoned house. The chandelier and smaller fixtures were the facets of murky crystals embedded in the clammy walls of an unknown cavern. In other words, this movie theater was merely a virtual image, a veil upon a complex collage of other places, all of which shared certain qualities that were projected into my vision, as though the things I saw were possessed by something I could not see. But as I lingered in the theater auditorium, settling in a seat toward the back wall, I realized that even on the level of plain appearances, there was a peculiar phenomenon I had not formerly observed or at least had yet to perceive to its fullest extent. I am speaking of the cobwebs. 
When I first entered the theater, I saw them clinging to the walls and carpeting. Now I saw how much they were a part of the theater, and how I had mistaken the nature of these long, pale threads. Even in the hazy purple light I could discern that they had penetrated into the fabric of the seats in the theater, altering the weave in its depths, and giving it a slight quality of movement, the slow curling of thin smoke. It seemed the same with the movie screen, which might have been a great rectangular web, densely woven and faintly in motion, vibrating at the touch of some unseen force. I thought, perhaps this subtle and pervasive wriggling within the theater may clarify the tendency of its elements to suggest other things and other places thoroughly unlike a simple auditorium, a process parallel to the ever-mutating images of clouds. All textures in the theater appeared similarly affected, without control over their own nature, but I could not clearly see as high as the chandelier. Even some of the others in the audience, which was small and widely scattered, were practically invisible to my eyes. Furthermore, there may have been something in my mood that night, given my sojourn in a part of town I had never visited before, that influenced what I was able to see. And this mood had become steadily enhanced since I first stepped into the theater, and indeed from the moment I looked upon the marquee advertising a feature entitled The Glamour. Having taken my place among the quietly expected audience of the theater, I began to suffer an exacerbation of this mood. Specifically, I sensed a greater proximity to the point of focus for my mood that night, a tingling closeness to something quite literally behind the scene. Increasingly I became unconcerned with anything except the consummation or terminus of this abject and enchanting adventure. Consequences were ever more difficult to regard from my tainted perspective. Therefore I was not hesitant when this focal point for my mood suddenly felt so near at hand, as close as the seat directly behind my own. I was quite sure that this seat had been empty when I selected mine, that all the seats for several rows around me were unoccupied, and I would have been aware if someone had arrived to fill this seat directly behind me. Nevertheless, like a sudden chill announcing bad weather, there was now a definite presence I could feel at my back, a force that pressed itself upon me and inspired a surge of dark elation. But when I looked around, not quickly, yet fully determined, I saw no occupant in the seat behind me, or in any seat between me and the back wall of the theater. I continued to stare at the empty seat because my sensation of a vibrant presence there was unrelieved. And in my staring I perceived that the fabric of the seat, the inner webbing of swirling fibers, had composed a pattern in the image of a face an old woman's face with an expression of avid malignance, floating amidst wild shocks of twisting hair. The face itself was a portrait of atrocity, a grinning image of lust for sights and ceremonies of mayhem, and it was formed of those hairs stitching themselves together. All the stringy, writhing cobwebs of that theater, as I now discovered, were the reaching tendrils of a vast netting of hairs, and in this discovery, my mood of the evening, which had delivered me to a part of town I had never visited before, and to that very theater, only became more expansive and defined, taking in scenes of graveyards and alleyways, reeking sewers and musty corridors of insanity, as well as the immediate vision of an old theater that now, as I had been told, was under new ownership. But my mood abruptly faded, along with the face in the fabric of the theater seat, when a voice spoke to me. It said, You must have seen her by the looks of you. A man sat down one seat away from mine. It was not the same person I had met earlier. This one's face was nearly normal, although his suit was littered with hair that was not his own. So did you see her? he asked. I'm not sure what I saw, I replied. He seemed almost to burst out giggling, his voice trembling on the edge of a joyous hysteria. You would be sure enough if there had been a private encounter, I, c I can tell you. Something was happening, then you sat down. Sorry, he said. Did you know that the theater has just come under new ownership? I didn't notice what the showtimes are. Showtimes? For the feature. Oh, there isn't any feature. Not as such. But there must be... something, I insisted. Yes, there's something, he replied excitedly, 
his fingers stroking his cheek. Well, what exactly? And these cobwebs? But the lights were going down into darkness. Quiet now, he whispered. It's about to begin. Soon the screen before us glowed a pale purple in the blackness, and vague images unaccompanied by sound began to take form upon it, as if a lens were being focused on a microscopic world. To be sure, the movie screen might have been a great glass slide, upon which were projected to gigantic proportions, a landscape of organisms normally hidden from our sight. But as these visions coalesced and clarified, I recognized them as something I had already seen, more accurately sensed, in that theater. The images were appearing on the screen as if a pair of disembodied eyes was moving within venues of profound morbidity and degeneration. Here was the purest essence of those places I had felt were superimposing themselves on the genuinely tangible aspects of the theater. Those graveyards, alleys, grimy corridors, and subterranean passages, whose spirit had intruded on another locale and altered it. Yet the places now revealed on the movie screen were without an identity I could name. They were the fundament of the sinister and seamy regions which cast their spectral ambiance on the reality of the theater but which were themselves merely the shadows, the superficial counterparts, of a deeper, more obscure realm. Farther and farther into it we were being taken. The all-pervasive purple coloration could now be seen as emanating from the labyrinth of a living anatomy, a compound of the reddish, bluish, palest pink structures, all of them morbidly inflamed and lesioned to release a purple light. We were being guided through a catacomb of putrid chambers and cloisters, the most secreted ways and waysides of an infernal land. Whatever these spaces may once have been, they were now habitations for ceremonies of a private sabbat. The hollows in their flesh, gelatinous integuments streamed with something like moss, a fungus in flimsy strands that were threading themselves into translucent tissue and quivering beneath it like veins. It was indeed the sabbat ground, secret and unconsecrated, but it was also the theater of a mad surgery, the hair-thin structures stitched among the yielding entrails, unseen hands designing unnatural shapes and systems, weaving a nest in which the possession would take place, a web wherein the bits and pieces of the anatomy could be consumed at leisure. There seemed to be no one in sight, yet everything was scrutinized from an intimate perspective, the viewpoint of that invisible surgeon, the weaver and webmaker, the old puppet master who was setting a helpless creature with new strings and placing him under the control of a new owner. And through eyes unknown, we witnessed the work being done. Then those eyes began to withdraw, and the purple world of the organism receded into purple shadows. When the eyes finally emerged from where they had been, the movie screen was filled with the face and naked chest of a man. His posture was rigid, betraying a state of paralysis, and his gaze was fixed, yet strikingly alive. She's showing us, whispered the man who was sitting nearby me. That horrible witch has taken him. He cannot feel who he is any longer, only her presence within him. This statement, at first sight of the possessed, seemed to be the case. Certainly such a view of the situation provided a terrific stimulus to my own mood of the evening, urging it toward culmination in a type of degraded rapture, a seizure of debauched panic. Nonetheless, as I stared at the face of the man on the screen, he became known to me as the one I encountered in the vestibule of the theater. The recognition was difficult, however, because his flesh was now even more obscured by the webs of hair woven through it, thick as a full beard in spots. His eyes were also quite changed, and glared out at the audience with a ferocity that suggested he indeed served as the host of a great evil. But all the same, there was something in those eyes that belied the fact of a complete transformation, an awareness of the bewitchment, and an appeal for deliverance. Within the next few moments, this observation assumed a degree of substance. For the man on the movie screen regained himself, although briefly and in limited measure. His effort of will was evident in the subtle contortions of his face, and his ultimate accomplishment was modest enough. He managed to open his mouth in order to scream. Of course no sound was projected from the movie screen, which only played a music of images for eyes that would see what should not be seen. 
Thus a disorienting effect was created, a sensory dissonance which resulted in my being roused from the mood of the evening, its spell over me echoing to nothingness. Because the scream that resonated in the auditorium had originated in another part of the theater, a place beyond the auditorium's towering back wall. Consulting the man who was sitting near me, I found him oblivious to my comments about the scream within the theater. He seemed neither to hear nor see what was happening around him, and what was happening to him. Long, wiry hairs were sprouting from the fabric of the seats, snaking low along their arms and along every other part of them. The hairs had also penetrated into the cloth of the man's suit, but I could not make him aware of what was happening. Finally I rose to leave, because I could feel the hairs tugging to keep me in position. As I stood up, they ripped away from me like stray threads pulled from a sleeve or pocket. No one else in the auditorium turned away from the man on the movie screen, who had lost the ability to cry out and relapsed into a paralytic silence. Proceeding up the aisle, I glanced above at a rectangular opening high in the back wall of the movie theater, the window-like slot from which images of a movie are being projected. Framed within this aperture was the silhouette of what looked like an old woman with long and wildly tangled hair. I could see her eyes gazing fierce and malignant at the purple glow of the movie screen. And from these eyes were sent forth two shafts of the purest purple light that shot through the darkness of the auditorium. Exiting the theater the way I had come in, it was not possible to ignore the words restroom so brightly were they now shining. But the lamp over the side door in the alley was dead. The sign reading, Entrance to the Theater, was gone. Even the letters spelling out the name of the feature that evening had been taken down. So this had been the last performance. Henceforth the theater would be closed to the public. Somehow I knew this to be true. Also closed, if only for the night, were all the other businesses along that particular street in a part of town I had never visited before. Despite the fact that they had been lit up before, even the ones that had shut their doors at that late hour, the shop windows were now dark. And how sure I was that behind each one of those dark windows I passed was the even darker silhouette of an old woman with glowing eyes and a great head of monstrous hair.